and I did a master's degree in philosophy, but I looked at the moral imperative underpinning healthcare and healthcare delivery and started to just sort of really look at the issues of the disparity between the quality and access to medicine of the haves and have nots of the world. But also, I was at Oxford where you have an eight week term, then a six week break, then an eight week term, then a six week break, then an eight week term, then a three month long vacation. And moreover, Oxford had these indigenous trust funds that allowed you to do things on your vacations. And there was one in particular which was called the AC Irvine Grant for Oxford students to enjoy a strenuous holiday in mountains abroad. And so my partner and I began climbing in the Alps. I had a great climbing partner at Oxford. And, uh, but it turned out that the more exotic of a locale you chose, the more cash money they gave you. And up to this point, I'd really always just kind of followed a guidebook. I was always kind of trying to come a little bit harder, climbing one more route, and I'd look in the guidebook, where should I go next? And all of a sudden, these Oxford grants allowed me to explore and go places that people hadn't gone before. And my partner and I got really lucky with weather. We went to uh, an unclimbed big wall uh, on Mount Kenya in, uh, in Africa. We went to an unclimbed big wall in Afghanistan, which at that time still hadn't had a war. And uh, then the craziest trip, we had a grant to go to Erie and Jaya, New Guinea to climb a 2,500 foot wall that had never been approached. And we've seen pictures of it. It, it goes directly to the highest point between uh, the Himalayas and the Andes. And it's the highest point on the uh, Australasian continent called Karsten's Pyramid. And we had the AC Irvine grant, and we also had an American Alpine Club Young Mountaineers grant. So we had the money to go, but we didn't have permission to go because there was a low-level guerrilla war going on between the Indonesian natives and the, um, and the, uh, uh, the Indonesian army and the Dani tribes people who lived in the mountains. And we flew in um, with a missionary air fellowship pilot. We landed in a sweet potato patch. And then um, we had to figure out how to get to the mountains. We were about 8,000 feet with people who were mainly using stone tools. We had 12 bags of salt, 12 bags of, so of sugar, 12 steel machetes, 12 Boy Scout knives, and 12 steel axe heads that we wanted to trade for 12 people to go with us to the mountains. And no one seemed to understand it well. One of my favorite uh, of sort of adventure books, a book called uh, The Snow Leopard by Peter Matheson. And uh, he also wrote a book called Under the Mountain Wall, where he lived with the Dani tribe for a year. And he had about 250 word word list. But these were the lowland Dani, and we were with the highland Dani 60 miles away, and not a single word resonated. So we were trying to figure out what we were going to do. And uh, we went to the village. Uh, uh, sort of chief, the Chalmot, and we were trying to explain what we wanted to do, and we um, I started, finally took out a piece of paper and pen and started drawing pictures, trying to show them, you know, we want Donnie to go with us to the mountain. And uh, we had this one guy get really excited and agitated, and I thought, okay, great, we got the village Rembrandt, we're going to play Pictionary, we'll get this figured out. But that's what happened to the pen. And uh, we finally sort of thought we had it sorted, and we handed out our bags, and then everybody completely unpacked our bags and handed it to other people. We thought, okay, this trip's over, but then the whole village filed out, and we went with the entire village for three days, and we ended up with 24 people who went all the way to the mountains with us. And it was the most amazing experience. We were these supposed adventurers wearing the latest in Gore-Tex and fiber pie, all with a Gore-Tex tent with interlocking poles. And I was always uncomfortable. It was too hot, too cold. It was clammy. It was always raining. There were bugs everywhere. And the Donnie seemed comfortable all the time. And at night, they would chop down trees with a stone axe and build a house as fast as we put up our tent with interlocking poles. They'd take a pandanus leaf, break the tip off, have an organic needle and thread, and sew it together to have a waterproof covering for their house. It was always raining. They'd take uh, 
dry moss out of their kebowak or pindus gourd, hit two pieces of dry a flint to it, catch it in the moss, blow on it, put it down, put the wood on, blow on it. They'd have these huge flames that wouldn't burn down the house. And I was just so amazed watching them. And I tried to start a fire with the same wood. I wasn't even close. I had waterproof matches, windproof matches, a lighter. I took pages out of the book I was reading. I took fuel out of my stove. I wasn't even close. And one of the Donnie saw me struggling, took a little bit of dry moss, two pieces of flint, blew on it, same wood, big fire. Um, they would make these completely uh, um, waterproof ponchos out of the pandanus leaves. And why barefoot people would know how to get to sharp, rocky areas uh, and go <laughs> naked to 14,000 feet, I have no idea. But we ended up getting to the mountain, and we did make the first ascent of both of those rock faces that you can see. Those are the second and third highest peaks in the range. And we also did the first ascent of this 2,500-foot climb on the north side of uh, Karsten's Pyramid. But the whole experience was really just being with the Dani natives. We uh, ended up getting to the top. But we also, on the way out, uh, we uh, got arrested by the Indonesian soldiers. And we were in the area illegally. We didn't have permits. We ended up going to jail. It was uh, pretty scary. We had language issues and young people with uh, automatic weapons. And I ended up uh, being incarcerated in Indonesia during my first two weeks of medical school. And so I showed up in medical school and still excited to be an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, I, uh, my, my local medical school was really nice. They sort of had special orientation for me. They had people kind of helping me, you know, catch up. And everything was fine, except that about uh, halfway into the year, I got asked to speak at the American Alpine Club's annual dinner about uh, these uh, big wall jungle climbs and our adventure in New Guinea. The climbs really weren't that hard or that difficult, but uh, the adventure was pretty out there. And so I, I gave my talk at the American Alpine Club, and afterwards a couple of my climbing heroes said they were coming to the East Coast, did I want to climb with them? So I took them to my local East Coast climbing area called the Shawangunks. And when you go to your local area, you can sometimes appear to be better than you are. And we had a great time together. And they said, we have a trip going to be the first American climb in Tibet, going to try to make the first ascent of the east face of Mount Everest. Your teammates will be all of your heroes who you've been reading about since you started climbing. And it's fully sponsored by National Geographic and ABC Television Sports. And you'll be paid a year's tuition to medical school to go on the trip. Do you want to go? I went, eh, yes, I, I, okay, I, 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 So I got all excited about it. I kind of went, wahoo. All my climbing friends went, wahoo. And so I filled out an application for a leave of absence from medical school to, uh, to uh, go on this trip. And this is one of those, you know, crazy things of serendipity. I got a phone call about two weeks later from a guy. He said, is this Jeff Taven? I said, yes. And he said, you're an idiot. And I said, excuse me? He said, you're a complete moron. I think you're the dumbest person ever accepted to Harvard Medical School. And I said, well, who is this? And he said, well, my name is Dr. Mike Weedman. And I'm on the committee looking at leaves of absence from Harvard Medical School. And there's no way none, zero, less than that, that you would ever get a leave of absence to go climbing. But anybody with half the intelligence to get into this school should know that if you apply to do research, Harvard will give you credit. And I happen to be an ophthalmologist interested in the effects of high altitude on the retinal vasculature. And in specific, can we look at high altitude retinal hemorrhaging as a prognosticator of high altitude cerebral edema? So let's forget about your climbing and let's talk about our research project. So this was my research team. This was our lab. <laughs> and uh, the research consisted of three three sets of photographs. I took a set of a photograph of everybody's retina before the expedition, during the expedition, and after the expedition. So three sets of photographs, three months credit. And we did publish, it says high altitude uh, retinal hemorrhaging. We did uh, publish that uh, 
you know, seven out of 11 climbers had uh, high altitude retinal hemorrhages that were not otherwise uh, uh, detected. And uh, it was, I presented at the uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology meeting, but uh, I was still pretty focused on climbing and still thinking I was going to do something in orthopedics. So we did go, this is the east face of Everest. This is, uh, the base of this is 17,000 feet. The top of this buttress is 22,000 feet. And climbing at this technical level hadn't been done on a peak the scale of Everest. This was 1983. And this is uh, my teammate George Lowe, who led a lot of the hardest pitches. Uh, we had about 1,500 feet of fairly straightforward rock climbing. That led to some unconsolidated snow ridges. This was our first camp on the mountain. And then we went up to our first really good staging camp. Above that, we had 1,500 feet of completely continuously overhanging rock. And then we had uh, 11 out of 11 climbers go above 25,000 feet without supplemental oxygen. And uh, we ended up with uh, uh, six of us reaching the summit. It was the first descent of the east face of Everest. And it's now 40 years. Our route has still not been repeated. And I was kind of struggling and kind of figuring out my way of what I was going to do in medicine. I had this, by the time I matriculated in medical school, I knew I wanted to do something in global health. And I had this idea I wanted to do something now with maybe, maybe contractures from polio in children and children, you know, sort of crippled children. And I didn't really know how or where or what I wanted to do. I applied uh, for a residency in orthopedics, and I did an internship in general surgery and then a year of orthopedics. And I was thinking, how am I going to be working, doing what I want to do, and how is this compatible with sports medicine? And I got invited to go back to Everest with, in 1988 with a team that was funded to get the first American woman to the top following the more conventional route up from uh, the south side. Uh, we went in during the monsoon, um, through the Kumbu Icefall. I'll go a little faster. We had about 10 days of very nice weather, and we had three Americans get to the top. Stacy Allison became the first American woman to climb Mount Everest. And two days later, I went with Peggy Luce, Dawid Searing Sherpa, and Nimatashi Sherpa. You see now all these lines of people on these ropes. In 1988, we still had no ropes. We just climbed uh, at our own pace with no ropes. And um, this is uh, Peggy Luce and uh, Nimatashi Sherpa coming up to the summit. I had a really just beautiful summit day. And on my way back from uh, uh, Everest, I worked at the uh, Nepal Orthopedic Hospital. And I didn't really see how I was going to integrate that with my career. And one of the people who I met during our 83 trip was Sir Edmund Hillary. And he's been kind of one of my heroes, not just for his climbing, but for everything that he's given back. And he built uh, hospitals for the Sherpa people and schools. And he had a hospital in a place called Faplu up in the hills, one of the poorer sections of Nepal, where the doctor from uh, New Zealand had just taken ill. And... I uh, was asked to fill in as a doctor there. And I was supposed to go back to my orthopedic residency. And it was one of those things where you just sort of think, and I decided, no, I want to stay and work in Nepal. And I uh, stayed in Nepal and worked as a general doctor. And it was, it was very frustrating, because a lot of the things that I was attempting to deal with were really public health issues, problems of poor conditions, poor diet, non-sterile water. I had kids coming in with diarrhea. I'd rehydrate them, give them antibiotics. The same kid would come back just as sick two weeks later. And I had children dying of pneumonia, children dying of diarrhea. And things would be so easy to care for in the West. And I was just filling out applications to do a PhD in public health when um, I saw a Dutch team come in and do cataract surgery. And in America, when you walk around, you don't see a lot of eyes that look like this. This is an absolute cataract. And I'd never seen that in medical school. But in Nepal, it was just accepted that you get old, your hair turns white, then your eyes turn white, and then you die. And uh, 
we had probably 40 people in my little community who were blind and they were shriveled in corners waiting to die depressed and it's a burden on the family a Nepali term for a blind person is a mouth with no hands and when you're in a subsistence agrarian economy a mouth with no hands was a real burden and it took somebody out of the workforce often a child who didn't go to school to take care of the blind person and a Dutch team came in led by a doctor named Jan Koch and they did cataract surgery and it was crazy. The next day, people just blossomed back to life. I'd never seen anything like it. People went from shriveled and depressed to life. And I went, wow. And I went back to Kathmandu. This is now 1989. And there was no one in Nepal doing modern cataract surgery with a lens implant. The cloudy lens, it's like a peanut M&M. It has an outer candy shell. It's actually more like the skin of a grape. And then there's a layer of protein called the cortex, which is kind of the chocolatey mess, and then the hard peanut. And the first surgery that was reported was from the ancient Sumerians would take a needle and try to dislocate the lens back into the vitreous cavity. And if it didn't destroy the eye, they didn't get an infection, you'd go from only seeing light and dark to seeing shadows, and you wouldn't walk into a tree, and you could find your food. The first kind of semi-modern surgery was done uh, in Germany, a um, doctor named von Grafe described cutting the eye, basically filleting it in half, taking out the lens and figuring out a way to reattach the tissues. They didn't have microsurgery in those days, so people used to have to spend two or three weeks with their heads with sandbags. But then they started giving these really thick glasses uh, called aphakid glasses because people were making glasses, but they caused a huge prismatic distortion. And unfortunately, that was the modern cataract surgery all the way until the 1950s. And there were a few advances. They started doing microsurgery so you could sew it back together so you didn't have to spend three weeks with a sandbag. They used a digestive enzyme to help break the adhesions so you could more easily take the lens out, a freezing probe, but you still had these thick glasses. And then the big change came in the 1960s. There was a doctor uh, named Harold Ridley in England who took care of an RAF pilot who had the windshield from a Spitfire blown into his eye. And he postulated if he remained inert for 15 years, maybe he could make a lens replacement out of the windshield of a Spitfire. And so by the 1980s, it was completely standard that you would replace the lens inside the eye when you took it out with an artificial lens implant. But the least expensive lens implant in 1980 was $300 on the world market, which made it absolutely prohibitive for the developing world. So now I, I, I got so excited. This was something I could make a difference. I called my old professor at, uh, at Harvard and said, wow, you were right. Because he tried to get me to go into ophthalmology. I said, you were right. I should have gone into ophthalmology. I just watched this amazing cataract surgery. I want to go into ophthalmology. And he said, uh, well, I just heard there's a position that's just opened out of the match at Brown. Because ophthalmology is an early match. You apply early in your fourth year. And then you do your internship. And then you start your ophthalmology. And someone who had matched had, for you know, personal reasons, decided not to come back and start the residency. So I came back from, uh, and it was actually when I went to um, uh, interview, the only thing that uh, got me my, inter my job was my research in high altitude retinopathy. And uh, the, uh, <laughs> the chairman was familiar with that. So I ended up deciding in April that maybe, that was, it was April that I watched Dr. Koch do the surgery. It was in May that I decided I really want to do ophthalmology. I came back to the States in June, and I started my ophthalmology residency July 1st. So the next thing is then, how do you, you know, you're, you get this idea, this kind of excitement, this is something I could do and make a difference. And, uh, you know, Nepal had a backlog of 250,000 people blind from cataracts, 60,000 new people going blind a year, and zero modern cataract surgery being done by Nepali surgeons. So this was the, but how do you do it? Well, one thing I didn't know is my, I, 
well, first, the one person who was really advocating, you really need to teach local people. Because at that time, most of the ophthalmology programs were kind of on the missionary model, where the great uh, American doctor would fly in, do two weeks of surgery, and then fly out. And um, the one person who was really advocating teaching was the second person in Fred Hollows. And his main disciple was Hugh Taylor, who's the world's expert on infectious blindness and a cornea specialist in Melbourne. And I began communicating with them. And what I didn't know was that Sandik Ruit, who's the uh, gentleman in the back row in the middle, was already finishing his final fellowship in Australia right when I was in Kathmandu seeing that no one in Nepal was doing modern surgery. And Sandik grew up in a little hill village, three days walk from the nearest road, no schools, no electricity, no running water. And uh, at the age of eight, he was involved in a very bad cooking fire. And his dad carried him to a monastery where the monks said um, you know, a few prayers and put balms on him. And after a week at the monastery, the head monk told his dad, wow, this kid's incredible. You got to get him an education. So at the age of eight, his dad walked him for 11 days to Darjeeling, India. He spoke not a word of Hindi and not a word of English. And his dad left him in an English medium uh, Jesuit school. And uh, nine years later, he had a scholarship to uh, King George Medical College in Lucknow. He scored number one on the continent of India in his medical boards. He then did his ophthalmology residency at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi. Went back to Nepal and was noticed by the same Dutch doctor I watched, Jan Koch, who said, wow, you need better training. And Dr. Koch brought him to the Netherlands, where he did three years of repeating his residency. And then he did a two-year fellowship with Fred Hollows in Australia. And then the same week that I started my ophthalmology residency, he started our program in Nepal. And I was just so fortunate I got sent over during my fellowship to work with him. And it was just, again, another one of those wow moments that he's really the genius behind anything I've been able to do and sort of my elder brother and advisor. And I went on a outreach cataract program with him. It was sort of like a, you know, a, a uh, climbing expedition, except these are our partners. There's a woman who's totally blind with cataracts being led for three days by her sister who can barely see with these thick Coke bottle-like glasses. And Dr. Rui had already had a great way of sort of seeing, you know, identifying in these remote areas. And again, these are two more people with these thick Coke bottle-like glasses, which was the only surgery that was done in Nepal before Dr. Ruid. And using a copious amount of uh, betadine and antiseptic and face washing, um, we have the infection rate basically the same as what we have in America. We worked side by side for three days. I'd been to all these sort of fancy training programs. And we did uh, all of these advanced cataracts. We did 224 cataracts in um, three days, which sounds like a lot until you get the breakdown that Dr. Rui did 201 while I did 23. <laughs> and I had to call him over to help me probably 10 times because I hadn't been operating on these. But the other really great active genius between Dr. Rui and Fred Hollows was they said, why are these lens implants so expensive? They're made of polymethyl methacrylate, which costs nothing. Why can't we manufacture them in Kathmandu? So they raised the funds in Australia, took the technology, and they started the first low-cost interocular lens factory in Kathmandu, which opened in 1994, which was right when I came to work with Dr. Ruiz. Really. So we had these lens implants now that only cost $4. And it instantly just transformed the global market for doing cataract surgery and the global economy of cataract surgery. And, uh, and the joy was just infectious. It was just crazy. And so I finished my fellowship in Australia, and I moved to Nepal. And I didn't have any money moving there. I worked. Uh, I lived like I'll never live again. I had a cook. I had people doing things for me. They did my laundry. I got taken care of like I'll never be taken care of again. But. Um, it was, it was really fantastic, and I lived in Nepal for 18 months. Um, here we don't have a lot of blindness. Our blindness is mostly related to aging. Our big cause is age-related macular degeneration. Um, 
and you don't go totally blind. You lose your central vision. You can't drive. You can't read. But 90% of the blindness in the poor countries of the world, there are almost 40 million people who are blind, 100 million with significantly low vision that really affects their ability to work at all. And 85% of the blindness on our planet could have been prevented or could be cured. It's the number six impediment to the world economy. And we've tried to push like to the Gates Foundation and people like that that we need more funding for eye care. It would be actually about $14, million, $14 billion dollars to overcome all needless blindness on Earth. $14 billion. You figure our defense budget is $860 billion. And uh, anyways, they say, well, we're you know, not looking to provide service and we're looking for fatal diseases. But once you go blind in the developing world, the life expectancy is about one third that of age and health matched peers. And for children, it's much worse. And again, it takes somebody out of the workforce, there's a huge amount of lost productivity. And blindness really perpetuates poverty. But the other thing is that poverty really accentuates the suffering of being blind in poor countries. And when you look at the leading cause of blindness, I mean, for low vision, just lack of spectacles. And uh, then it's cataract, which is completely treatable. Glaucoma is, um, is a disease of high pressure in the eye. Uh, trachoma, onchocerciasis, or infectious diseases, and xerophthalmia are the leading cause of blindness in children, and it's nutritional, and then corneal trauma and infection, so, which can easily, with just a little bit of antibiotic, be prevented. So 85% of the blindness can be easily treatable and prevented. This is cataracts, the number one cause of blindness. I'm going to try to wrap this up in the next about five to six minutes, but the... the um, one of the big problems we're having is in a lot of places where we're getting better cataract surgery, if you have blind people who are unable to function, then you're looking at about 18 million people. But if you start operating where we would call someone legally blind, where you can see two lines down the eye chart, then all of a sudden it's 60 million people. And if you start operating, if you come to watch me, I operate every Tuesday at Stanford. You guys are medical students, are welcome to come join me. I operate uh, usually once a week at the VA with our residents. Even at the VA, the average vision is a little bit of blurriness. You know, people seeing well in one eye, they're struggling to drive at night with the other eye, they get their cataract fixed. It's one of the best things we do in medicine. But if you start operating where we operate in America, it's eight times that number. And a lot of the people who, even in poor countries, who are working, who are still driving a taxi or working in a store, they're willing to pay to have their cataract done before they go blind. And so the blind people are getting left behind. Glaucoma is a disease of high pressure in the eye. Trachoma, as I mentioned, is an infectious disease of poverty. Um, river blindness, it's not in a lot of the world, but where it's endemic, it's devastating. Xerophthalmia is a uh, lack of vitamin A in the diet. And uh, once the kid's corneas melt, there's nothing we can do. But it costs 75 cents per year per child to keep them from going blind. The problem is the places where we're seeing a lot of people going blind, Somalia, Congo, uh, uh, South Sudan, it's just hard to get the medications. Um, and then the big thing that's coming up is diabetic blindness, which is, when I was in Nepal, I never used to see uh, overweight people. Now there's a Krispy Kreme donut shop in downtown Bergamarg, there's a Kentucky Fried Chicken, Wimpy Burger, and people are changing their diet. So I, as I said, I moved to Nepal, and we started the program really to develop the training and infrastructure to overcome the blindness. And the kind of, you know, I've been so lucky because I've had some great mentors between you, Taylor, Fred Hollows, Mike Weedman in Harvard, and then now Sandik Rui and some of the really great Indian doctors. I've had just incredible mentors. And we've been really successful at bringing all the NGOs and organizations working in eye care together, figuring out ways to reach the unreached, try to bring down the cost with local manufacturing. We created a system that's been called uh, compassionate capitalism, where paying patients subsidize the care for the poor. And by doing really high volume surgery, we've been able to bring down the cost and bring it down. We've developed a sutureless extracapsular cataract technique that provides essentially the same quality care uh, for uh, about $30 that we do for you know $5,000 here at Stanford. 
Um, this, I, I won't, because of the time, I won't show this. This is a surgical video of how we do it. And this is just showing our team approach where we can actually do uh, a, a full surgery about every four minutes. And uh, through having the whole kind of team approach, the patient, um, and having a team where no one does anything anyone with lesser skills can do. And again, the, the sort of the whole approach and everything was really worked out by Dr. Rui, and also a couple of great Indian hospitals, the Aravind Eye, Eye Care System and the LV Prasad Eye Care System are sort of two of our other big partners. And what you're gonna see here, I won't show the whole surgery, but at about a minute and a half into the surgery, you'll see the next patient's already getting prepped and draped and ready on the next table. So what I did for the first couple of years was working to try to teach Dr. Rui's cataract surgery methods and developing um, um, skills, not just of the doctors, but also the nurses, the technicians, ophthalmic assistants, and figuring out ways to provide really great care for a huge number of people in, in really very good time. That's going to be opening the outer candy shell in the lens. And... Um, then we were sort of running into a problem. So we were training more doctors. We need to get more microscopes. We need to get more equipment, more op operating instrument sets. And when I tried to get uh, funding from uh, the states, people said, oh, he's living in, in Nepal. Either he didn't pass his American boards or he's running from a felony or why is he living in Nepal? And so you see now we're 138. The, the hard peanut of the cataract's just been mobilized. But meanwhile, the next patient's already prepared on the next table. So we ended up publishing a lot of our results and the quality, and people said, oh, yeah, it's fast surgery, but it's not so good. So what we did was we, we did a prospective randomized trial. I brought uh, David Chang, who's kind of the marquee cataract surgeon for sort of head of the cataract section of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Um, we had a pharmaceutical set up his full operating room at a monastery in Nepal and uh, either doing the uh, $5,000 U.S. surgery or the $50 Nepali surgery. It was my own version of the Iron Chef. <laughs> and my secret ingredient, oop, my secret ingredient was the, was the absolute cataract. And the results, if you titrate it down to 20, 30, were exactly the same, whether corrected or uncorrected. And we really started sort of figuring out how can we expand what we're doing. Nepal's the only large poor country that's reversed its rate of blindness. We expanded fairly seamlessly. Um, and again, we have this compassionate capitalism where 60% uh, of the free care is subsidized by the 40% who pay. And by doing very high volume. And uh, we uh, expanded to Tibet. Uh, we trained 24 Tibetan doctors. We moved into Bhutan, which is another country that's completely reversed its rate of blindness. They had a wonderful king named Jingmi Wungchuk who wanted to realize the gross national happiness of his people rather than the gross national product of the country. And um, um, we started having one resident a year. We basically trained doctors to do good cataract surgery. We took our best young cataract surgeons and sent them uh, because of my connections in Australia, to Australia for subspecialty training. And once we had a retinal specialist, a pediatric ophthalmologist, a corneal transplant specialist, we started a full world-class residency. I came back to the States and have always matched our residency in the States with our residency program in Nepal. But uh, and then in 2006, I'd been at the University of Vermont for 10 years. And I was having trouble spending the amount of time I wanted. I always, one of the things I always did in my career was always sort of trade off less money for more time. But all of a sudden, they didn't want me to have the amount of time I wanted. And I moved to the University of Utah. One of my partners in Utah, who you can see actually on the right there in, in those pictures, is a picture from Ghana, was already doing the highest volume of surgery in Ghana. And so I moved to the University of Utah in 2006 and began uh, focusing more on Africa because unfortunately in Nepal, now everybody was a better surgeon than me. They all did everything <laughs> really well and things were kind of in motion and going without me. So we began trying to transpose the same systems that were working so well. We've had a lot of problems. We, the cost recovery 
in Nepal, 85% of the blindness was cataracts, a huge amount of myopia in children. And even very poor people are willing to pay a little bit to subsidize glasses for their children. And somebody who, you know, even a, a subsistence farmer, if you're making $2 a day, that's $60. And that's about what people are willing to pay to have their second cataract done. So you can do the first cataract on a patient in Nepal, and with $60, that helps subsidize a lot of the free care. Now, in Africa, there's a lot more glaucoma, but there's a lot of infectious blindness, and a little less than half of the blindness in Nepal is from, from cataracts. And then when you look where there's blindness in the world, you can see Africa's this big bloated country along with South Asia, but when you look where they're ophthalmologists, Africa is this little shriveled continent. And there's an even bigger lack of uh, the paramedical workers. And one of the things that really helped us transform things in Nepal were really developing the nurses, ophthalmic technicians, ophthalmic assistants, and uh, that's lacking as well. But they're still the same joy, and I still get the same amount of joy out of it. Our, I'm now spending about three and a half months of the year uh, working in Africa. This is from Ghana. We're teaching at all levels, the same as what we were doing in, um, in Asia. We're currently working on an economic impact study that I hope will change the way things are funded, showing how much money really comes back to the economy. You know, if you, because um, we do surgery on a lot of people who are really still quite young. And there's still just such a joy. I mean, it's like when you take the patches off, people go from being totally blind to seeing. And there's like a, a moment of hesitation of looking around, and then there's just incredible joy. And if you go to the World Health Organization in Geneva, the only statue is of a child leading his father by a stick. And this is a 50 second video just showing the joy and then I'll turn it over to Rhoda for any questions you all might have. Yeah, Okay, so um, that's a little overview of sort of my journey. And you know, I've gone from where I really had just the most amazing mentors to you know, what I see as my career now and going forward is really being a mentor to some of the you know, really good young superstars, particularly, and I've got a couple of amazing young uh, mentees in Ghana, a couple in Ethiopia and Rwanda and certainly in Nepal and Bhutan. And uh, awful lot to do, but there's sort of an awful lot of joy. So I'll turn it over to Rhoda now. So one of the questions that were asked by several people who filled out the Google form is, uh, what advice do you have for young people interested in pursuing a career in global ophthalmology? So I think really the only advice I have is follow your passion. You know, that whatever you really love doing, there's so much need and there's so much disparity currently between the haves and the have-nots in the world. There's so much and it's all great. You know, and you're, you're really touching. You know, one of the, the cool things about the eye is that even though these statistics are crazy, they say, you know, 18 million people are blind from cataracts. But when we operate, 
that person is no longer a statistic. They are 100% cured. And anything you're doing in global health, you're touching an individual person. And it's one of those things that, you know, I, I always try to stress to our residents because I, I deal with a lot of really bad, you know, bad disease, a lot of bad problems. And then somebody will have a very mild little red spot on the side of their eye. It's really kind of nothing to me. But to them, it's the most important eye issue that they have in the world. And it's what caused them to drive an hour to get to Stanford, try to figure out how to park, get to my office, wait for two hours. And then this is the most important eye problem that they have. And when, when you're working in, in global health, I think one of the key things is to remember that each individual person you're dealing with, even if you have lots of sick children who are dying and you're saving their life, and you have one kid who has the most minor of an earache and you just give them a, you know, a ciprofloxis, an eye, eardrop, and they'll be fine, that's still the most important issue in, in that kid. So I guess the three things would be, one, follow your passion and do what you love. Remember that each individual person is just so, so important. You know, we, it's easy when you're looking at global health and these huge statistics, and I especially see it in a lot of the kind of big NGOs who are doing big programs. They get caught up in the numbers and they forget about the individual. Thank you for that. Um, another question was, um, what are some of the biggest challenges you have faced in your work with the Himalayan cataract surgery and its uh, expansion to um, Sub-Saharan Africa? Well, in, in terms of challenges, I mean, it's really in, on getting the equipment in. You know, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, we've had, one of the things that was really nice for me is that I had Dr. Ruit leading the way, and he was really, you know, the team captain, leader, star player, and I was kind of the fat boy playing because I brought the ball. And he would tell me what ball I needed to bring. And so he was really uh, magnificent at finding the right, the right partners, the right people, which really made it very easy for me to just focus on, on doing the work. Um, we moved into Bhutan again, and we have a phenomenal partner, Kunzang Getchen in Bhutan, who was the one who really figured out the human resources and who we should be investing in. And my Asian partners were always spot on. And one of the things I took me a while to really get were who are the right and best partners. There were political issues. We were working in Bhutan. The government was totally with us. In Nepal, the government was totally supportive of Dr. Rui. They didn't really help us, but they didn't hinder us. In Africa, we've had more political issues with governments. We've had more problems in sustainability and sustaining funding. A lot of the places we've been working in teaching doctors have been, in, for instance, in a government hospital. I'll use Ghana as an example. We, um, we, uh, we found that there wasn't really the facilities to be able to really develop a great eye surgery program in Komfo Onochi Teaching Hospital in Kumasi, which was the only ophthalmology training program, uh, only ophthalmology dedicated hospital in a university setting. So we built a new eye hospital. We took three really wonderful, motivated, great nurses, and we brought them to Nepal for a year of training. And then we brought them back, and then they were so good. They'd been back about a month, and the director of the hospital had changed because the government changed. It was a political appointment to be the dean of the medical school, and the new dean said, well, you're going to become the, the head nurse in OBGYN, Doris. And you, Gladys, you're going to be the new head nurse in neurosurgery. And the three nurses that we had just 
paid to have a year of training in Nepal. One became the head of orthopedics, one became the head nurse for OBGYN, and one became the head nurse for uh, neurosurgery. And so we, we've had problems on that side. We've had problems in cost recovery as we try to expand the system because it's in a government and There's so much, I could go on for hours. But we're, we're slowly, slowly moving forward and we're actually trying to get out of the government system and building an independent center of excellence in Cape Coast and also doing the same thing in Ethiopia. Um, I guess my question, my follow-up question to that is like, uh, aside the government interference, what about the physicians and the, um, the patients? Have you like... Well, the patients, there's no problem. I mean, the patients are wonderful everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so, but we've had problems with physicians, you know, unfortunately in God, you know, in, in Ghana, for instance, uh, absolute best people in the medical school class, uh, you know, often want to come to a residency in America and anything they can get into America. And if they can't get into America, then it's England. If they can't get into England, then it's Germany and then, or Canada. And so in Nepal, we have, when we started, when I started, Dr. Rui was already emerging as a national hero. The best students were all going into medicine and the best people in medicine, ophthalmology, when we started our residency, we had the absolute top students applying. And when we started our residency in Ghana, I'm, I'm just harping on Ghana because you're <laughs> Ghanaian, when we started our residency in Ghana, we, uh, you know, uh, I came back, I wasn't involved in the interview process, one of our first residents, and I said, so, you know, why did you choose uh, ophthalmology? I'm excited to have you in the field. He goes, well, you know, there was a position open. I tried to get into pediatrics, but my grades were too low, and then I tried to get into pathology, and then I spent a year working in a pathology lab, and I reapplied in pediatrics. I couldn't get in, and I reapplied in pathology. I couldn't get in, and there was an open position in ophthalmology. And the problem is that when you take someone like that, they're not going to be excelling the same way our doctors were in Bhutan. So it, it's taken us a while to get the kind of real superstars. But one of the big things has been you know, funding and, and keeping the funds in the system. And until you can get the, you know, right now, the remuneration for an ophthalmologist in Nepal is excellent. It's one of the highest paid subspecialties, which also attracts more people. In Ghana, it's still not one of the highest paid specialties. So, you know, in, in, until we get the quality up, we're right now the best, the wealthy people of Ghana are still coming to America for their cataract surgery. They're still coming to Europe for their cataract surgery. They're going to India for their cataract surgery. Until we can get all those people staying in the system, keeping the money there, so it's sort of a chicken in the egg, but we're just breaking through now. Well, I wouldn't say the outdoors deepened my passion for, I mean, it exposed me or it led me to Nepal, which led me to ophthalmology. But I think one thing about climbing is that you, you do face a lot of obstacles. And it's really kind of the journey. You know, you never, you know, it's never getting to the top of something. It's the whole process and the whole day and the whole everything. And when you're working internationally, you have to be open to, to a lot of failure <laughs> and to a lot of new obstacles and new challenges and trying to think out of the box of how you can get around a situation. And, you know, a lot of people who go into medicine in America in particular are risk-averse overachievers. 
and America is one of those few places where if you work really hard and you're pretty bright, put one foot in front of the other, you'll kind of get somewhere in medicine. Whereas when you're trying to do something globally, particularly if you're trying to develop something, there are so many obstacles that come up and so many things that happen. And when you climb, you never know about the weather. You never know about the conditions. And you have to keep on adjusting and kind of love the process. So there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of similarity between the way I approach the outdoors and global medicine. But, you know, up, but that would apply to almost anything in global medicine. I mean, whether you're doing pediatrics, you know, public health vaccines, uh, trying to figure out a way to deal with uh, cervical cancer, whether you're looking at, you know, the onslaught of diabetes and heart disease. It's all, you're still running into these obstacles where you've got to sort of think outside the box and have a tolerance for the unknown. Yeah, Josh. I, I, you know, I, don't think, I don't think it's that hard. I think the key thing is having a passion and doing whatever you're doing full on while you're doing it and doing it well while you're doing it. So that if I'm, when I was in medical school, I was, you know, focused on the hours I was in medical school. Yeah, I'd go rock climbing on the weekend, but I would, you know, actually I would have a, had a partner who would drive and I would read in the car on the way there on the way back. I, mean, I was very focused, you know, when I was an ophthalmology resident, I was very focused on being the best resident I could be. And I think as long as you're present where you are and passionate about what you're doing now, um, things work out pretty well. Well, <laughs> okay. See you later, Josh. Thank you very much for coming. It's very pleasure to meet you, and good luck. Well, she was asking about what we're probably facing. Actually, in Ghana, we're doing pretty gosh darn well. You know, we, we, we have two really good training programs. We've got a lot of subspecialists. We've got a nurse training program. It's taken, you know, a lot longer than it took in Nepal. So um, I, I was using Ghana only as an example because of <laughs> Rhoda, and that was the first place I started working. And, um, you know, it's taken us a while to get things going, but things are... Um, Ghana is actually comparatively, when you look at you know, <laughs> Nigeria, Sierra Leone, you know, uh, Liberia, any of the Francophone uh, West African countries, Ghana is really becoming the leader in eye care. Um, now, the place I've been, I mean, I've been working a little bit since 2012, but we've got a very large grant for South Sudan. South Sudan is the toughest place. I've ever tried to work and, and am currently working. 
And so, so why do you take on something where there's so much government corruption and such a difficulty? Well, there, right now there are three ophthalmologists for 16 million people in South Sudan. There's so much blindness in South Sudan and each individual person. And I think, you know, it's, it's sort of where you can make even just a little bit of a difference. And, you know, uh, after working, you know, since 2006, so it's been about 16 years, I've been working in, um, in, uh, in Ghana, you know, we're, we're where we were after 25 years in Nepal, but we're really doing quite well. Ethiopia is doing fairly well. Rwanda is the one, you know, uh, country in uh, sub-Saharan Africa that's actually doing great in terms of eye care. And, you know, the you know, worst places in the world probably are Afghanistan right now. And just as a little sidelight, if America would have spent what we spent on our military budget for one month in <laughs> Afghanistan, we could have cured everybody in the world who's blind from cataracts. But, and we certainly would have had a lot more friends in Afghanistan. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's just the way of the world that, you know, there are places with political difficulty and uh, actually one of my partners and protégés, kind of mentees from America, I just got a, an email from him as I was coming over here. He's working in Somaliland right now in our first foray into Somaliland. And I think that there, there's a, a big challenge in going where there's the most need. And there's a challenge in going where it's the most difficulty. You know, we're going to look at the east face of Mount Everest and saying, whoa, <laughs> how are we going to climb this? Or being, you know, uh, an ignorant 19-year-old and who's never climbed anything higher than 800 feet and going out and the first route you get on in Yosemite is, uh, the, you know, the nose of El Capitan. I think there's a, a sort of a mindset of willing to take on big challenges and seeing that you know it's kind of important. I, mean, I don't want to have more people like Rhoda's father have cataract surgery and go blind after cataract surgery. And then, yeah. It's a really important thing, and one of the big things is just keeping up. It's not so, you know, you're getting biomechanical engineers to keep up the equipment. And there's so much, you know, donated equipment from the Western world that's furniture in, in Asia and Africa because it breaks down. There's some so little thing, maybe one wire becomes disconnected that nobody can figure out, and it, it just is getting in the way and clogging things up. So we've been, you know, in the place, you know, Nepal, India, in Bhutan, in, in Ghana, in Ethiopia, we have biomedical engineers. And actually when I go to uh, South Sudan, I bring with me a biomedical engineer from uh, Ethiopia. The problem is that when I come back from South Sudan, the biomedical engineer from Ethiopia goes back to Ethiopia and so we haven't gotten to the point where we're, we've trained biomedical engineers. But that, that's a huge thing. And the whole you know, supply chain and getting, getting things, most of our pharmaceuticals now come from India. And we have great, great supplies that are coming from some couple of great manufacturers in India. But we've had you know, problems with them getting caught up in customs. And that's something that, you know, sort of the whole ecosystem of our program is involved with. But